There are a few things that, at least to me, are as instantly recognizable as science as this image. Or this one, or any of these. You may not know what's going on, but you probably recognize that A, it's something to do with biology, B, it's some sort of test, and C, it's both alien and beautiful at the same time. These are immunofluorescent images of various types of mammalian cells. These images I actually prepared myself several years ago. I got a chance to make them while I was studying in university, and crazy lab coordinator aside, it was honestly probably my favorite lab. There are two things that make these images possible. The first is a marvel of chemical and biological engineering in the form of fluorescently labeled antibodies, which are special proteins that can be targeted to stick to essentially any protein in a cell and fluoresce under UV light. The second is a special microscope, which can expose the sample to UV light to make it glow, and then only capture the glow without overwhelming the camera with the pump UV light. Combined, this technique lets you map out the location of proteins in preserved cells, or watch them move around as the cell functions to study their interactions. Now, I don't have the reagents to do immunofluorescent staining, as they can be very expensive and specific, and I don't work with mammalian cells these days. But what I do have is various organisms that have been genetically modified to produce fluorescent proteins. A fluorescent microscope would be great to have so that I could look at the individual cells and see which ones are actually expressing the gene properly. And in future experiments, I can use these proteins as a reporter so that I'll know just by looking at them that glowing cells must be producing whatever other protein I'm having them make. Some groups use a similar idea to map out different kinds of cells in a piece of tissue, like these slices of brain. Various neuron types were modified to produce fluorescent proteins so their location and interactions could be studied. But fluorescent microscopes are very, very expensive. Even the cheap ones cost thousands. So I've spent months attempting to modify my cheap $200 scope to function as a fluorescent microscope. The final mod is actually very simple and cheap, costing all of 20 bucks, but finding the right combination of light sources and filters was tricky. Also, a small caveat is that you also need a camera that can take long exposures, but it's assumed that you have one, so I'm not counting that in the cost. I'm also not counting the microscope itself in the cost. Other than trial and error finding the right light sources and filters, the thing that really slowed me down a lot was that most filters start letting light through at around the greenish wavelengths. So using GFP as my test molecule, which glows in that range, made it really hard to see when anything was actually happening. The issue is that most cheap UV light sources bleed light of non-UV wavelengths that can easily blot out the actual fluorescence. So there was no good way to know if the light was from fluorescence or just some weird refractive effect. But recently, I got some RFP-producing E. coli, which we've talked about in several recent videos. RFP emits light that is red-orange, so now seeing the glow is much easier. After I had lots of RFP growing, refining the setup to where it is now took only a week or two. So what did work? First, the light source, no LED was sufficient, and all had horrible color bleed that totally ruins the effect. A cheap 405 nanometer laser pointer is a must and very, very effective. I actually stole this one off of my spectrometer, as I'm waiting on a fresh order of these. These little lasers have become my go-to for UV illumination, as they're the only cheap thing that can give you good UV light without too much color bleed. They're not perfect, far from it, but they only cost $2 a pop if you buy them from China. I recently picked up 10 that I'm waiting for in the mail. As for the filter, I used a cheap dichroic mirror off of eBay. Dichroic mirrors are really weird, and probably deserve a video of their own, but honestly, even to the people who study optics, they're basically black magic. They're made by depositing and layering different types of semiconductors of specific thicknesses onto a piece of glass. The result is that you can make them reflect or pass whatever wavelengths of light you want just by messing with layer and composition. In this case, I picked up a reflect blue, pass red and green mirror for 10 bucks off eBay. This means that under a certain wavelength, everything is reflected, and above that wavelength, everything goes right through. In a commercial fluorescent scope like the one that I used back in my old university lab, they'll either have a series of these mirrors that each block out and pass different colors of light, or one more complex mirror that blocks out several specific wavelengths of light while letting the rest through. The result is that any pump light, be it UV or otherwise, will be reflected away from the camera while the glow goes right through. In combination with high-quality light sources, these high-quality dichroics let you use a whole range of fluorescent molecules, all the way from blue to red. The cheap dichroic I'll be using here isn't nearly as good, but will still work for most fluorescent molecules that are green to red. The only ones that you can't use are ones that glow blue, like DAPI, a common nucleic acid stain used to highlight the nucleus of a cell. But this is dealt with by just using a different nucleic acid stain that glows green, orange, red, or anything in between. Again, you get what you pay for, but this isn't really a big deal. There are so many fluorescent products available these days that it's easy enough to just modify your protocol to use a different stain. To actually modify your scope to do this, we first remove the headpiece, which will expose a cavity with a lens in it. 
In a previous video where we modified the scope to see polarized light, we put a small polarizing filter in this spot. This time we're going to do the same thing, but with a dichroic mirror. But because of how much UV is involved, we also need to tape around the mirror to make sure none slipped past. Once the filter is seated, you can reassemble the microscope. For the light source, I carefully bent the laser diode so that it was facing up, as I couldn't otherwise fit it underneath here. This is the most rough part of this setup, and as I go to use this more, I'm going to 3D print a housing for all these parts and mount things properly. I unscrewed the illuminator tube, removed the LED from it, and tucked it away into the microscope housing. I then disassembled the rest of the illuminator tube to extract its lens. This lens will spread the laser light out, but also the rough backing makes the light diffuse rather than a concentrated spot. I just carefully stacked everything under the scope using a microscope slide as a base. Again, this will get a pretty case off camera. I just wanted to show that it doesn't need to be fancy, and also my 3D printer is broken at the moment. The extra nice part of this rough setup though is that I can turn on the white LED and it still shines up through all of this. So while I'm trying to focus the image in the microscope, I can use this far brighter white light to see what I'm doing, then just turn off the LED and adjust my camera for the UV image. Speaking of camera, I'm using my Nikon D3200, and you'll need to play with the settings a lot to get this working. You'll need to adjust the alignment of the laser as well as your exposure settings, and laser power to get a good image. But fair warning, if you drive these lasers at 4 volts, they are really bright, but also get really hot and eventually will burn out. So even though it makes it easier to see what you're doing, I'd suggest running the laser at a lower power and just taking longer exposures. Also, a quick note about the condenser, this extra lens under the sample. You'll need to play with the height of it as you're trying to take images, as different magnifications benefit from having it closer or further away from the sample. It controls how tight of a light spot you're shining onto your image, so at higher magnifications you want to concentrate that light down more. But that's it, and this mod is done. One final note is that I covered the extra ocular with some tinfoil just to make sure that if any stray UV got through, it isn't going to shine directly into my eye. Also, I put this piece of fluorescent orange plastic to cover everything and also prevent any stray UV from shining in my eye. Okay, let's take this rig for a test drive and see what it can do. First up, the GFP yeast. Just for comparison here, this is what they look like when I first tried this using a UV LED as my light source. Now here they are with the laser. The difference is, I would say, pretty spectacular. Even at low magnification, you can tell that some are glowing more than others. And as you zoom in, little droplets of yeast cells look like some sort of strange mineral. It's really quite pretty. And then at full zoom, you can see the individual cells. It's crazy to see how variable the gene expression is here. I will say that it's hard to get video of all of this. Even with the laser, you need to turn the exposure up a lot to see things live. You could use a stronger laser, but then you need to take a lot more precautions as you're setting this up, and run a higher risk of cooking your sample. So whenever I shot video, it tended to be pretty grainy. Hence why I stuck to taking nice long exposures once I'd found a spot that I was interested in imaging. Next, here's some of the RFP E. coli. At low magnification, the glow is pretty intense and vibrant, but as you zoom in, it's clear that most of that glow comes from clusters of cells. The setup just isn't very good at picking out the individual bacteria glowing, as the glow is just so dim. Here's one view, first in white light so that you can see some individual cells, and then here it is again in UV. There's maybe some hint of something, but the other issue is that at these magnifications, focusing can be very challenging, as the white light focus and the fluorescent focus isn't quite the same. And the amount of light is so low that even at max ISO on my camera, seeing well enough to actually focus this is a challenge. That's the price of doing this with a cheapo scope. Here's one of the better images that I've got of, of just a few bacteria. The glow is faint, but definitely there, though it still seems like the glow is coming from maybe half a dozen bacteria clustered together. This is one of many reasons I like working with yeast. They're so much bigger that it makes it easier to work with and analyze. But that's basically all there is to it. Fluorescent microscopy is no longer something that is confined to expensive university labs, and now with only a few extra dollars of hardware, a cheap entry-level scope can be used as a very reasonable fluorescent scope. And I'm sure that with more effort, this could be improved further. Before I close out, I want to take a moment to thank the patrons of this channel who make these projects possible. As I mentioned, I've spent months tinkering with this, and my Patreon supporters and channel members are the main thing that give me the freedom to take the time to figure out hard problems like this. So thank you again, and if you'd like to help keep the flow of videos coming, then consider supporting the channel in these near-weekly deep dives into the weird world of science and engineering. And that's where I'll end this video. As always, you know the drill. Like, leave me a comment, and subscribe and ring the bell to see when I post new videos. If you'd like to see the projects long before they end up in videos, be sure to head over to my other social media pages. I'm a bit of a shutterbug, so Instagram tends to be the most project-focused content. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.